Put on the roster here. Talk about our, our shared love, Ms. Lee Harris, little Queenie, because I got to see her and be with her at the, the beginning of her, uh, her musical career. I got down here to New Orleans in uh, October 74, and uh, I met Lee in the middle of the summer of 75. And uh, how that happened is uh, one of my favorite, my two favorite bands in, in New Orleans at that time were the Meters and uh, the Rhapsodizers. And uh, Clark Freeland was the guitar player and crazy visionary in the, uh, in the Rhapsodizers. And he, he brought Lee down to the quarter I was playing at uh, Frankie Ford's doing a little uh, solo gig down there. Clark told her that uh, we might be a good fit. And because uh, Lee was Lee was playing, uh, she had played maybe just three or four gigs by that time, but she played uh, guitar and, and sang and uh, played guitar well, but uh, she didn't like doing that because she wanted to have long decorated fingernails. <laughs> there may have been other reasons why she enlisted me, but uh, <laughs> so, but you know, she she wanted to be the lead singer, uh, and uh, so I would go out to her house there in, in Metairie, and uh, she had she had already adopted her style of the short, bright red hair and shaved off eyebrows. Uh, but very recently before that, she was a long blonde haired uh, guitar player. And uh, she knew guitar, she, she was playing, you know, she was, uh, and her songwriting was, was really just fully developed then. I guess she was, she was 19 at the time. And uh, yeah, her, her songs had, uh, used every kind of, you know, chord structure, and uh, she was very good musically, and of, uh, of course, we all know she's a, a great wordsmith. She was the girl that did the uh, New York Times Saturday and Sunday, you know, in pen, the, the crosswords. She was, she was literate and just really smart, you know. Uh, so we, I would go out to Metairie there and we, we started practicing, working up tunes and writing tunes together. And uh, the thing that I really was impressed about Lee, of course, was her singing. And uh, she could blast it out, but I, I really uh, was impressed that she could sing, you know, low volume with, with just all kind of nuance. And, uh, <clears throat> Later on, after we had, we had gone up to New York, and uh, a guy from the New York Times wrote about her, raving about her, and, and, and called her the next Janis Joplin. And uh, Lee was offended by that. <laughs> she thought she had more range than, than Janis, you know. And uh, she wanted to be, uh, she wanted to be Annie Ross, you know. My analyst told me. I was right out of my head. You know, that was, that was more, more of Lee's style. Uh, and uh, another thing I, I thought Lee always did great was uh, pick cover tunes. You know, she, the first time I heard her, uh, she was singing uh, Randy Newman's Guilty, and, and she just slayed it. But uh, another one of, then, you know, she also uh, did Rubber Ducky, which was a, originally a Kermit Frog song. But uh, I remember one memorable performance of it at uh, Chafunka Campground. Oh yeah, that was she, a good uh, show. She, she took her halter top off and, uh -huh. and danced <laughs> yeah, the saxophone solo. Yeah, yeah. 
I had pictures of that. You can be sure nobody remembers the sax solo. Oh, mm, no. <laughs> I'm not going to go on too much about Lee. I could go down all kind of roads with, with that, but uh, just uh, I'll, I've been talking about Lee, you know, as a, as a musician, which, which she was just as, you know, deep and wide as, as anybody that's ever lived in, in that area. But uh, she, was, she was also really loyal to, uh, to those people that she played with. And anybody that's played with her knows that. And uh, one example of that, we hadn't been going too long as the percolators. We started up with, with just me and Lee, and then uh, our standard lineup for probably three years was, was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, bass and drums and saxophone. And uh, uh, a pretty famous producer, I'm not gonna say his name, but he came down, heard us at Tipitina's, and uh, was, was blown away by Lee. Offered her a deal that was, you know, just the, the, the top of what, what kind of, you know, record deal you could get. Uh, if, uh, but she had to ditch the band and, and uh, you know, go with, with his production and uh, with his studio musicians. And, and Lee just turned him down flat. And, and I was, uh, I, I was telling her, I thought that was a bad decision. You know, like she should go ahead with this producer. She can still have us, you know, on the road. And, uh, but she was, she was adamant with that. And, and with uh, a lot of other decisions, along that line. Uh, she, she did what, what Lee thought was best for the music. And, and I will say that uh, even though I, I told her I thought it was a bad decision, I think that musically it was a good decision because I think we played what, you know, was, was good for her, better than, you know, any hotshot studio musicians would have. But, yeah. Lee was, Lee was always uh, just, just really loyal to her, to her friends and her, you know, people she, she worked with, and uh, you know, that's, that's all I want to say about Lee. She was a beautiful soul, big, big part of my life, and uh, will be greatly missed. Today we now have a good time, and Lee was certainly a musician and a singer. But we're going to remember Lee, the person and the human being today. Uh, in the Native American tradition, uh, they use these rattles, and this was given to me when my sister passed, and it helps to summon their spirit and their energy. And so we're going to welcome Lee's spirit and energy here today, and hope that we can enjoy that. I'm just going to tell you all a little story that I heard not too long ago, uh, and I thought it was kind of appropriate because a lot of us feel this emptiness and this missing, right? We're standing upon the seashore, and a boat was at our side. She spread her white sails to the moving breeze and starts for the ocean. She's an object of beauty and strength. We stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a little speck of white cloud just where the sea and the sky come to mingle together. Then someone by our side says, there she is, she's gone. Gone where? Gone from our sight, that's all. She's just a large and mass, she's just as large and hull and spar as she was when she left our side. And she's just as able to bear her load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in us, not in her. And just at that moment, when someone said, there, she's gone. On the other side, there are other wives watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout. 
here she comes. And we know a lot of our friends who are there waiting for her on the other side. With that, I'd like to bring up the loving husband, Rick Ledbetter, who is uh, by her side for all these years, especially the difficult times. And Elite could occasionally be a little difficult, and that's just because she was sick. Uh, and here's Rick to say a few words. Way back when, when we were young and foolish, um, I was living across the lake in Hammond, Louisiana. Oh, I had retreated from New Orleans and was hanging out there playing in this little band. Um, I'm not going to tell that part. <laughs> and uh, there was, uh, so I was playing this little gig up in Pontchartilla with the band. And uh, after the gig, there was uh, four, three, there was three little girls that wanted to ride back to Hammond. And uh, so we all piled in the car and back to him and we went. And that was we, Sally, and Ella. And that was the first time I met Lee. And uh, then she babysat for my daughter, Claudia, who is, stick your hand up. There she is in the back. And uh, eventually I moved to New Orleans again with Claudia. And, Claudia was starting Lusher Elementary, and I was starting Loyola, and I had a one more fling with Lee, and this is about the time that Lee started with the Purple Ears and Johnny and all that, and I was going to Loyola, and we just did like this and drifted apart. Eventually, I went out to Los Angeles as a musician and came back, wound up uh, in Williamsburg, and then the K word, Katrina. And, uh, so I put out the word, uh, anybody from New Orleans who needs a place to stay can come up and pay with me. And eventually, uh, I got a text message, or an email from Lee, who had bought this house in Rural Hall, North Carolina. And she came up to visit. And I have not seen Lee since 78, 79. And it was like, Two people that had been uh, beat up too much, clinging to each other. And uh, she stayed for a few days. She got to stay for a week, and you know, four months go by. And so, <laughs> okay, I gotta go back to my house. So we went down the road, and we came back up, and we were walking along the York River in Williamsburg, and just looked at each other at the same time and said, spontaneously, we need to get married. So we did, and we had a discussion about whose house was going to get sold, and everybody knows how that one would go when it leave. Oh, so we moved in together, and that was uh, an interesting adjustment, considering that you know, all your astrologer buffs in here will probably cringe when you hear this, but she was a Leo, and I'm a double Scorpio, and I'm surprised that we didn't kill each other. But we both realized there was something there. And we held on to this. And there were times, like I said, I wish I could kill her twice, you know, and I'm sure that she felt the same way about me. But we just kept going and we kept going. And it was like peeling an onion. The layers and the years of the fence melted away and we realized the core of what we had. And in the final years, maybe the past six years of Lee's life, we essentially became, for all practical purposes, two 15-year-olds in love again. You know, if you guys can remember that, you know, <laughs> no encumbrances, just two people in love. And we continued that until the time she passed. And that is the memory, let's get it, that I care about, um, care about me, my family. And uh, I just wanted to share that with everybody. That uh, she passed with a pure heart and a lot of love. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rick.
uh, when I moved to New Orleans in 1997, Lee was my very first friend. And I knew how to sing, but I didn't know how to do much else. She taught me almost everything I know. She didn't sing this song originally, but when she sang it, her version was the only one that mattered. Now, 
we had a very special, obviously, special connection to this next uh, young man, uh, first son Alex, who I saw right after he was born. He changed a couple of his diapers. Yeah. <laughs> Gross, I know. Alex, do you want to say a few things? He really did his mama proud last night when he sang that song. Yeah, he did. He will continue to do so right now. Alex Harris McDonald. Thank you for coming. Um, as a, you know, for the most part, I never really planned anything to say. I just figured I would do it like my career and fake it till I make it. <laughs> 18 years later. Um, Lee, as a mom, she literally embodied that euphemism, the cool mom. Um, you know, she, uh, she always made sure my childhood was really something to be remembered. And she made sure I knew who Pee Wee Herman was. She made sure I knew who Bugs Bunny was. And she never pushed a whole lot onto me as far as, you know, academically. I mean, not that was really good shit. Um, <laughs> But she did push a certain, a certain spirituality into me that, that I'm never really going to forget, especially uh, you know, making the holidays really special, which is probably why I believed in Santa Claus till I was about 13. <laughs> but what I was getting at is she instilled the spirit of that on me, which is probably why that was to be. And, you know... You know, she was always kind of the envy of all my, my friends. You know, wow, you really do have the cool mom. And I didn't really see it until I was, you know, well in my late teens, probably 19 or 20. And, you know, you know, certain performances were just almost, you know, it was right after I really got into music, I was just, you know, sitting back watching her. After a couple of drinks, and be like, holy crap, this is truly the, one of the baddest MFers to ever really come into existence. And, uh, you know, musically, she made sure I knew who Stevie Wonder was. And she made sure I knew who Fishbone was. Yeah. And how Chili Peppers and so, and so much and so forth. And, uh, you know, the amount of love being shown in these last few years, you know, there's really not much I can say that I haven't said already publicly or through social media or anything like that. But, um, you know, I'm glad we all could come together and remember her like this. And you all look fabulous, by the way. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for heeding the request. Uh, you know, and, you know, the things I remember, she was into the Vishnu vibe very heavily. You know, the, the armed thing. And, you know, uh, after, after Katrina, she... You know, unfortunately, she was done here. Um, didn't exactly make me happy because it was kind of sprung on me. And I was, I was living in Lafayette, Louisiana at the time. I was kind of just dumbfounded. I mean, I knew she wanted to, you know, get out of the city, but I didn't know it was going to be that soon. But she did have a nice, quiet, peaceful life up there on Harmony Hill in Rural Hall. And, uh, you know, she... She did her best, and you know, I'd like to think I'm somewhat of a decent human being because of it. And yeah. 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 And very early on in my career, I wasn't digging the attention, and I told her that. And she said, oh, you don't like that? Quit. <laughs> that was about 18 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, you know like, like I said, there's not much, really much more I can say about what a really stellar human being she was. And, you know, we, 
you know, when she did move away, there was that kind of, you know, she went to live her best life and left me to live mine. And, but we stayed in touch as much as humanly possible. Always went out for the holidays and opened her house and her heart to me and all my guests, all my, my extended family. And, uh, and she really, she was a powerful force. And, you know, I'm glad she can be remembered in this way. And, you know, having gone out like she did with, you know, the people, the two of the people that were closest to her, that, you know, that, that, that soothed, really hurt, it was potentially there. And I mean, I've made my peace with it long ago. And I'm, for the most part, I'm good. If anybody's curious. killer band to do the second line, and I hope you all enjoy it. And I have a new breed brass band, some good friends of mine. And uh, I don't know how, how, how many times can I possibly say thank you and I love you. And, um, you know, let's, let's live our best life. I met this uh, next woman a long time ago, but I didn't remember quite as much until I, I went to visit Lee in North Carolina and she was there. I was like, I remember you. <laughs> I'm sure if we had a couple of hours, she could regale us with uh, years and years of fabulous stories. But she was there during some of the most difficult times and she was a tremendous help to Lee and Rick and family, uh, Patty. Patricia Tooley's daughter. Hey, Patty. First time I heard Lee sing and Netta was at the same time and she was singing behind a mannequin making finger waves at John J. Charm Beauty College. <laughs> she was singing with the radio Midnight at the Oasis. Oh. And I was like, oh my God, who is this chick? I fell in love instantly. I fell in love with my best friend at that moment. I like the way Maggie said he met Lee at the beginning of her musical career, but I met her at the beginning of her adulting career. You know, and, and becoming an adult, and, and when John said that about the dates, when I met Lee, it was January 74. So it only took her one year from singing behind that mannequin to singing as a career. And it was amazing, she touched my life. She touched everybody's life. You know that. When everything they say is true. She knew fucking everything. <laughs> she did it. She could remember everything. Uh, she didn't drive until she was 40, but she could bring you wherever you needed to go. She knew the directions. And I was like, I've lived here my whole life. Where are you taking me? And you never even drive. But, you know, that was our adulting. And, you know, we started off on the road together. And as everybody's life, you know, you go in different directions. You take different forks. But our life, mine and Lee's, we always went back, you know, to, you know, hanging out. Like, we always talk. We never not talk on the phone. But, you know, and then we'd hang out. And we'd be a few years, and then we'd go off, and we'd hang out. And then, like, the early 70s, and then the 80s, she, I stood for her in her wedding, she stood for me in my wedding. I was there when Alex was born. And let me tell you, Lee and Labor was fun. <laughs> Especially because Alex was breech. And 